Some of you are involved in retail, others are not. So I want to take the lessons from agile retail and you can make the connections into your own business because actually I believe there are fundamental lessons which touches all as consumers which we'll see for our own lives. Now I live on the outer edge of this radar screen because most strategy is to do with the center. You know, it's doing things better, optimizing and the rest. Outer edge is where exciting things happen. It's where you have opportunity, risk, all kinds of amazing things go on there. But I've learned this, working with the largest multinationals in every industry, in just about every country of the world, over the last 25 years, I have learned this fundamental truth, that the greatest risk for every leader, for every business, in every organization, is two words, it's institutional blindness. When you have too many war game generals in America playing war games with each other, and I promise you, I have lectured to 500 generals and admirals from the Pentagon in the same room. What really scared me was discovering I was told that I was the first non-US citizen ever to address them on any issue. Does that worry you? I'll tell you this, when you have American generals, it's the same with the Ministry of Defense here in Whitehall. If you have MOD generals playing war games with each other, then you make a big miscalculation regarding North Korea or President Putin, correct? If you have subprime crisis banks, were caught, that subprime crisis was caused because we had too many banks spending too much time with other banks benchmarking their risks and their agility strategies against each other, and they all went over the same cliff together. So let's go on a journey, and let me show you, if I can, some of the ways in which we so easily become blind, and the blindness creates the opposite of agility. So the key to agility is opening people's eyes. You know what? I often say this. Once you've seen something, you can never unsee it. Something happens inside you. Let me show you an example from restaurants, okay? Let me show you something. I used to work as a waiter in a restaurant. I've learned this. You know, uh, when I was a student, I earned extra pocket money working as a waiter. Okay, put up your hands if you've had this problem. You come to a wonderful restaurant, Imagine it's in this room even, wonderful restaurant, it has a Michelin star, but you can't get the waiter to look you in the eye. Put your hands up if you had that problem. Let's have a look around. So what is it about waiters? I mean, what is it about waiters? Here they are. Why is it that most waiters spend most of the time examining the insects on the floor of the restaurant? I can read the entire room. I can read all of you tables more or less at the speed of light. And every time I smile, I make money. Champagne, coffee. Sweet. I've got eyes in the back of my head. It doesn't matter where I are. Yes, coffee, sweet, champagne. There are only a limited number of things that you actually want in a restaurant. How long does it take to train a waiter to look up instead of looking for insects? Less than two seconds. How long does it, what does it cost for a waiter to use their eyes? Nothing. How long for the waiter to discover that every time he nods, he makes money? Why? Because he gets a lovely tip, because he was the best waiter in the world. Lovely food, but the waiter was amazing. How long does it take for the restaurant owner to realize for the first time he's going to make a profit tonight? Less than three hours. So we see how easy it is to be institutionally blind. Literally, the waiter is blind. Literally, the restaurant owner is blind. He spent a fortune on his advertising. He even turned up to a conference on agility, but he can't train his waiters to open their eyes and smile at customers. Tiny things create agility, they create magic, and they transform your future. Here's another example. My wife and I were in Singapore recently, and uh, with the restaurant was so dark and the menu was so tiny that even with a torch, we could not read the menu. <laughs> the torch was provided by the restaurant because they realized they had a problem. Now, what is going on here? Let me tell you, this is the primary marketing document for the entire business. It is the menu. If you can't read the menu, you have no business. You know, you ha what happens is you have the waiter reading the menu because you can't read it yourself. Every restaurant, waiter uh, every restaurant owner should know that most of the money they make each night comes from people over the age of 50 because they order the better bottle of wine and almost all the profit comes from the wine that's drunk. Correct? So why is it that you create a marketing document that absolutely cannot be read by your primary marketing audience? <laughs> Institutional blindness, do you know why? 
because the average age of the guy or the girl in the print shop that designs these things is about 14 years old. <laughs> Institutional blindness. Here's another example of it. So last week, I checked into a five-star hotel. Fantastic service, amazing thing. In the following morning, I get up, I'm half asleep, I stagger into the shower, and unfortunately, I discover too late, I've completely covered myself in hair conditioner. <laughs> Put up your hands if you too have had a traumatic experience like this. <laughs> now, what is it? I spoke recently to 800. I'm so, see, you're, you're laughing. I'm not. It's not a joke. This is really serious stuff. This is blindness. You want agility. I tell you, you've got to take off your glasses, look at your business, start again. It's simple stuff, you shouldn't. I had 800 CEOs of hotels, the CEO of the Hilton in Madrid, the CEO of the Hilton uh, here um, this in London, the, the CEO of the W Hotels. You would think they would know better. Okay, I had 800 of them in front of me in Qatar. I showed them this, they laughed, they smiled, they cracked up, they were laughing so much it hurt, and then you could hear the groan. Because they're realizing in their hotel, 1% of all their guests every morning are covering themselves in hair conditioner. <laughs> Just like them. When they stay in their competitors' hotels, that's exactly what happens. So what happened? Because it's just because I don't wear my reading glasses when I go in there and I can't read that print. <laughs> so let's go on a journey and see how we can challenge institutional blindness. And go with me if you're not in retail. Let's learn the lessons from retail, just like we've learned the lessons from the hotel, OK? So let's go into retail. This touches us all because we are all buyers. We're all in retail. You can't escape retail, whether you're buying or selling or what. And I'm going to divide the future of your world into six pieces. They spell the word future, F-U-T-U-R-E. You can't keep the future in view at once. It's six faces of a cube. You have to keep spinning them. So let's spin it. And the first face, they spell the word future F. The first face is fast to do with the speed of change. And here we're seeing gigantic problems with agility or lack of it. When you think of what the customer is wanting, the customer is looking for new, 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 fresh, fresh, fresh. So in the olden days, we had the clothing, textiles, and design industry churning out maybe two fashion shows a year. Now the fashion cycle is 15 days, my friends. 15 days from someone designing something, well, actually it's copying, <laughs> okay? So what happens is a fantastic supermodel goes to the Oscars and everybody's photographing and the designers are right there watching the Oscars live and they're already formulating what she's wearing. And within an hour, they've completely designed it. It's gone into production in the other side of the world in 20 minutes later. Why? Because as she's designing it live, people are pricing it live. The pricing for, for absolutely everything and the first orders are being done. They're going to be flown around the world and they will be in Harrods, Selfridges and all the best shops here in London within 15 days for sure. And by the way, it will be only there maybe for six weeks and gone because the model's wearing something else in six weeks time. So agility, how do you do that? Well, I tell you it's technology, but it's a mindset. It's a mindset that we can re-engineer our supply chain at the speed of light as we're watching live TV. This is agility. Now, it doesn't matter who you are. If we're talking about supply chains, you're certainly not going to be able to send it by sea. Stuff happens. You know, sea transport is too slow for an agile company. Long supply chains are becoming history. If you look at uh, people like Ford or General Motors, they used to buy brake parts in China to import into Mexican factories to export a car into America. They can't do it now. Why? Because of the agility challenge. They don't know what's going to happen. They need a supply chain that will be measured in days rather than months. And that is why you're seeing south to south regional trade growing fast. That's why you're seeing reshoring, onshoring. You're seeing a uh, um, Production of American cars being moved to Mexico from Japan because Japan is too far away. Life's too short. And stuff happens. All kinds of things happen. Look at this. 60% of all memory chips were being made in Thailand in the same floodplain, and a flood came and it wiped them out. Agility requires, it requires alternative strategies. The days of having only one strategy are toast, finished. 
You cannot have an agile organization with only one strategy because the world can change faster than Donald Trump's tweets. And if you think what's happening in North Korea right now, I tell you there are more geopolitical risks in our world and perhaps in your business than for the last 35 years. Just think what happened on the streets of Barcelona just two nights ago. We are seeing the need for flexible, dynamic strategies. You always have a plan B. You always know what's going to happen if. That, you see, because the world changes faster than you can hold a meeting of your board. <laughs> okay. Now, the world is creating a great impatience. And this, 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 what I'm going to say next, is really important. It applies to every person here, not just retail. So imagine, you checked into a hotel opposite uh, a Bishop's Gate uh, last night. You, um, you're, doing your, you're, you're Skyping the kids. You're doing your email. You're on the phone. And you're watching TV. Um, at the same time, for some bizarre reason, you decided to check Britney Spears' birth date. I don't know why, but you decided to do it. How many seconds will you wait there? Okay, you're on Skype, call, email, eating a hamburger, doing everything you usually do all at the same time. You're waiting for Britney Spears' birth date to appear on her website, and nothing's happening on your iPad. Dun, dun. <laughs> How long will you wait for Britney Spears before you press the back button and kill the relationship? Put your hands up if you press the back button in less than five seconds. Because life's too short to waste your life on Britney Spears' birthday. Let's have a show of hands. What we're seeing here, ladies and gentlemen, is that in London today, those who are interested in agile leadership, after two seconds, you become irritated. After three seconds, you blame all the people watching YouTube videos in the room upstairs. After four seconds, you wonder if the entire internet is broken because it's being hacked by North Korea. And after five seconds, you have lost the will to live. And you've terminated the entire business relationship. Five second test, how long are your children waiting? Two seconds. How long is my granddaughter waiting? She's three. She waits half of one second. Because her life's too short to waste another second. <laughs> I'm just saying the five second test really matters. Five seconds in retail, five seconds for business to business, five seconds for online transaction, five seconds to answer the phone, five seconds to get an answer to a report query. Five seconds. You've told me. Uh, here's another example. Now, you see, a lot of things in the future, I shouldn't be telling you this, but they're changing very slowly. So slowly that I'm still in business after 30 years because reading the future is so easy, okay? There are lots of uncertainties, but the fundamental trends are easy to read, and here is one. See, okay, there's still a lot of cash in this room. Actually, there's about the same amount of cash in your pockets today than there would have been at an Agile conference 10 years ago. Did you know that? In Europe, it's actually gone up. So some things change fast, some things don't. You need to be very careful before you chase Agile customers down a big rabbit hole. Okay, so let's have a look at the reality. But here is another reality. Put your hands up if you find it very irritating how long you actually have to wait to get, to get the money out of the machine. You put the card in, you're watching it sink. It sinks, it sinks, it sinks. Put your hands up if you find that irritating. How long do you have to wait for that? Maybe five to ten seconds, but you want to kick the machine, okay? Put your hands up if you find it irritating how long you have to wait to fill a petrol engine tank in the middle of the rain and sleet and snow. It's only 30 seconds when I last counted it, but it feels like a million years. We are becoming very impatient. I tell you this, if you shave minutes off a process, you become agile automatically. One of the fastest ways to become agile is to speed things up. So a, a, a company I work with, they've got an insurance product that allows a huge corporation, it, it, it does the underwriting for the loan. It, it's, a, it's a very complex product. It's a, it's a huge corporation to take out a hundred million dollar bank loan in two hours instead of nearly six weeks because they've speeded up, they've integrated their systems, they're, they're cross-fertilizing different databases together, everything talks and it is fast. It's very smart. I tell you, actually it's still quite a long time. <laughs> Five second test. Okay, let me give you another example of a way to become agile. Okay. Heaven forbid, but let's imagine there's someone sitting in this seat here, okay, who has three children under the age of five, and one of them is just desperately ill at school right now. What do you think is the, prime, the most sensible way to communicate with this mother or father right now? Voicemail? You've got to be kidding me. The phone's on silent, and they're not going to take the call till lunchtime. What are they going to do? Email? Yeah, maybe. What's the one way that the school is most likely to communicate now? 
text or WhatsApp. Thank you. Put your hands up if you would be most expecting a member of your family to contact you by text or WhatsApp today if there was a desperate emergency. Put your hands up. Okay, next question. Put your hands up. If your primary method of communicating with your customer on things which are dum dum quite quick is WhatsApp or SMS. One or two. Give them a round of applause, folks. See, what it is is this. They have become agile and left all of the rest of us behind. Why is that? Because, you see, there's two kinds of customer relationship. One is the real one, the trusted one, the friend, and the others are just a business transaction. So what's happening, your customers are doing their real life on WhatsApp, the people they trust, their friends, they're communicating with WhatsApp at the speed of light, and everything else is email. And you know what? They never bother to open it now. Why? Because the only important people they want to talk to, they're talking to on WhatsApp. On a single contract, this may horrify you, in the last eight weeks, I've had 3,800 WhatsApp messages. I'm just saying, especially with emerging markets, this is absolutely number one. <laughs> okay, so becoming very impatient. Let's come back to retail again. Here we are, checking out, auto checkout. Put your hands up if you love doing this. Put up your hands if you hate doing it. Folks, the future is about emotion. We have to understand these things. Why? Because it takes five seconds longer than a human being. Okay. My wife's trying to get money back from the electricity company. They owe us a lot of money because every month they seem to charge us more than we use. Does anybody else have that problem? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I'm phoning them up. They already owe us £1,322 plus VAT. So I'm phoning, my wife's phoning them up. Press one for accounts. Press two for customer portals. Ding dong. You're, and then there's a two-minute compliance message saying your call's very important and will be recorded for training purposes. Put your hands up if you find that extremely annoying. Put your hands up if you think it is a social crime to put in such a system. And the people who do so should be put in prison for a very long time. I'll tell you this. Many companies here, and you've put up your hands, we're using these systems. We're installing them. Every telco does it. Every bank does it. What happened to us? I'll tell you, it's certainly not agile. I'll tell you what's agile. You see, all your customers are using mobile these days. I don't know anybody who really just uses copper lines. Mobile is where it's at. So we know the mobile number. That means we know who the customer is the moment they're phoning us. Now, it's not just, oh, yes, this must be the account at One Carlton Gardens. This is the account of the individual. He is phoning or she is phoning now. Because we know they're phoning now, we know from big data why. Like, actually... Three and a half seconds ago, we sent him his bill by email. <laughs> okay, it's about the bill. <laughs> you do not need to be a computer to work this one out. <laughs> so why don't we just switch it straight away? Any message that comes within three and a half seconds of an email must be about the email. So you switch it straight away to the department that is likely to deal with it. Is this smart? No. This is last century common sense stuff. It is as simple as the waiter opening his eyes. So we're seeing that the secrets of being agile are often incredibly simple. They're incredibly cheap and incredibly easy, but extraordinarily easy to miss. <laughs> okay, uh, here's another example. So retail, because we got so impatient now, up to 70% of all new retail stores sales are coming from people who live less than 800 metres away. Why? Life's too short to walk 850 metres. <laughs> okay, we haven't got the time. Uh, it's even worse than that. 40% of you sitting in this room have no idea what you're going to eat tonight. Why? Life's too short to plan ahead. So what we're doing is micro-shopping. We're grabbing something on the way home. Or perhaps we're going to eat out. That's another thing. OK, fast, urban. I'll go through these other phases more quickly. Urban is the greatest driver in the world because it's linked to demographics. One billion children alive today. There will never be as many children alive today in the history of human beings. Because as, in, as incomes rise, fertility falls. People have smaller families. One billion children, where they are, where they grow up, and where they move to, will drive the growth of your business for the next 50 years. 85% of all human beings breathing air today live in emerging markets. I don't know why anyone bothers to sell anything in the UK. No one lives here anymore. There's no one living in Europe either. People say to me, the future of the UK is in Europe. I say, oh, come on, the future of Europe is not in Europe. The future of Europe is in emerging markets. We're all going that way. You know, I went recently to, uh, to, uh, to Sri Lanka. I saw a huge city being built in the middle of the sea. This is in a country which is half the wage level of India. And guess who's building it? China. 
I go to Uganda. My wife and I have an AIDS foundation. We started 30 years ago in our own home. And we fight the spread of AIDS in mud huts across the world because actually it's the poorest communities that have been hardest hit. So there we are in mud hut communities in Uganda fighting the spread of AIDS and just nearby, one mile away, I'm seeing this enormous six-lane motorway being driven north to south across Africa. Funded by who? The Chinese. Why is that? Because the future, the only story in town is emerging markets regarding growth. You show me any market that's growing in Europe, you're simply killing your competitors because we're all saturated trying to sell to tiny numbers of people who actually aren't the really big story. One billion human beings will move from rural areas into cities in the next 30 years. An irresistible force that is even bigger than any Donald Trump wall from Mexico to America. How stupid is that? If you want to enter America, shall I tell you a tip? Just buy a ticket to Disneyland and stay. <laughs> How can the wall keep you out? <coughs> Never mind. So one billion people will move and they are creating the new markets. They're moving from mud huts to small towns, towns to cities, towns, to, uh, towns and cities to bigger towns and cities, and across borders, and eventually they get to Libya, and sometimes the result is tragedy. So we are dealing with a massive rise in the growth of middle-class consumers in these markets, uh, middle-class consumers which are transforming retail, and you go to Singapore uh, shopping centres, they look roughly the same as other shopping centres. At the same time, people are becoming more affluent around the world, they're eating out more, and Europe is dying. You need eight great-grandparents in Germany to produce a single baby these days. Because actually, if you only produce one, 1 1.4, 1 1.3 children per couple, that means that the population basically halves in every generation. You have to have 2.4 children per couple just to keep your population the same. And we've seen the same in Italy. You know, there will soon be a million over 90 in Italy, more than enough to swing the results of every election. Does that matter? It's certainly going to change a few more kids. And as our populations age, so our customers age and other things happen. I've already said about the over 50s needing larger print, but actually we need to rethink every aspect of what we do. Here's another very simple example. Okay. Put up your hands if I don't care what your age is. There's been times, especially around Christmas, doing Christmas shopping, let's say, when you've been really whacked out and all you wanted to do is just sit down. And for you guys here, maybe you're sitting down while the, your wife or your girlfriend is in the changing room and it might be the other way around. You're, as, 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 a, as a woman, you're sitting down while, I don't know, your husband's, I don't know, obsessed with another geek piece of gadgetry he wants to buy from somewhere. But whatever it is, put your hands up if you've been looking for a seat, you actually wanted a seat uh, shopping recently, okay? Let me tell you, this is an absolute survival thing. If you are uh, <laughs> over the age of 70, you actually need to sit down. You really, really do. I'll put up your hands if you know that you would have stayed in the shop for another hour and a half if there'd been a seat right there. Well, I tell you, the statistics show that a lot of people would. They just stay more. They regenerate. Even, even more so if there's a cup of coffee, which is one reason why there's so many coffee shops now in department stores. It's not just because it makes money. It's because it goes, oh, thank goodness for that. You regroup, re-energize, think you what you want to do, do a few social media posts, and back into the battle you go. So simple things, again, blindness to the restaurant waiter not using his eyes. How much does it cost to buy a chair? I mean, honestly, how much does it cost for, WH, for, for John Lewis to buy a chair? 40 quid. I tell John Lewis right now, there are lots of places in your store I would park a chair. In fact, I park a couple. In fact, I would probably put 100 extra chairs in every John Lewis store. It's just simple things, tiny things, but they really, really matter. Fast, urban, tribal, universal. Tribal is about, well, you know what tribalism is. Every brand is a tribe, every language is a tribe, every nation is a tribe. Brexit is a group of tribes leaving another group of tribes, and then another tribe wanted to go independent and go back in. Uh, we're seeing it in, in, uh, in Barcelona. We have the Catalonia tribe wanted to separate from Spain, and the moment they do, they want to join the EU again. That'll be a problem for them, but never mind. It's all to do with emotion. Tribalism linked to emotion, and it's emotional reactions to trends which drive the future more than trends themselves. It's linked to trust, and that comes back to WhatsApp again. 
There's no point in using a channel people don't trust. You say, well, they trust me, they'll read my emails. No, 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 no. I've said before that trusted relationships are happening through SMS and WhatsApp. I'm, just, I'm exaggerating a little bit. I'm just trying to help us to think about ways to be more agile. Now, actually, in a way, you don't want to be too agile. Certainly in your branding, sometimes it's incredibly important not to be. If you change Coca-Cola's brand uh, signature every two minutes, you'll kill the brand. If you change the taste of Coca-Cola too often, you'll kill the brand. It's interesting that in food retail, incredible, how incredibly stable brands are. Uh, put your hands up if you are giving your children food that, and brands that you bought, as a, that you tasted as a child like Bon Vita chocolate or, um, I don't know, Marmite or uh, stuff. Put your hands up, just wave them around. Kellogg's Corn Flakes. Trusted brands. It was good for your granny and she gave it to you and you're going to give it to your grandchildren too. So let's be careful with this agility thing that we don't overdo it. Now, when it comes to trust, actually we have a challenge in retail because we've, gone to, we've got the uh, budget end competing with the, um, with the sort of... Uh, uh, with, with other people that are trying to sort of somehow compete with budget, and then we've got uh, waitress and others at the top. Everyone's trying to be budget or premium, and, and uh, the middle ground is getting a bit stuck. But, you know, retail, you can compete on three of these, but it's impossible to compete on seven. The one you absolutely have to compete on is trust. Why? Because it's linked to emotion, which is linked to tribalism. It's linked to the brand. So if you're, if you're waitress, you'll say, well, we'll go for experience, inspiration, quality. If you're little, you'll say, well, we go for price, speed, uh, and I'm struggling. Yeah, well, but you've got to have trust. Trust is the non-negotiable one. You can debate about where else you go in the market. Now, how do you keep customers loyal, these tribes? Because the stronger your tribe, the stronger your loyalty will be. The more they feel part of your family, whatever business you are, the, more, uh, the better for your family. Well, certainly social media does it. Certainly experiences do it. And in retail, being a niche trader. It's having that specialist expertise that keeps people coming back and back. It's being an advisor on the journey of life. I'm going to come back to that word, advisor on the journey of life. It's being a specialist. It's being um, the reliable person you really trust. It's the, it's the place that has um, a greater depth of insight. It's a place where you go to learn about your product. It's a place where, actually, we're changing marketing altogether. Let me just say, I, I know um, it's about changing from shouting at customers to engaging with them on a conversation along the journey of life. Now, I, I speak to hundreds of, um, of managers, marketing directors, every year. And I would say that 85 to 90 percent of all the people in every marketing conference tell me that they hate marketing. These market dir marketing directors tell me they hate marketing. Why? Because they hate the pop-up pages. They hate the SMSs that pe other companies are sending into their phones. They hate being cold called. They hate the, the, uh, the, the letter drops which come through the mail which just burn up trees. They hate being forced to watch YouTube videos for more than how many seconds? How many seconds does YouTube force you to watch a video before you're allowed to click it away? Actually, it's normally three. You know why? Well, you know why. Because you've promised to personally kill anybody that wastes five seconds of your time. YouTube knows that. I mean, I work with YouTube. YouTube knows that. The five-second test, forget it. It's a three-second test. You have one second to start engaging your customer. Two seconds to convince them to start continue watching. Another one second, and then the, the party's over. You have three seconds only with a video, which is maybe a minute long, to actually engage them. Why? Because if you run it for five seconds, the more Tesco runs five minutes, Five, minute, five seconds where they force you to watch, the more you vow never, ever to go into Tesco's again. So that means that the more money you spend on marketing, the more you will kill your brand if you're forcing people to watch for more than five seconds. These are really serious things. So I wasn't joking about it. Go and look at YouTube's algorithm. You'll see why they've got this right. So if most people who are marketing hate being marketed at, let me ask you guys, because some of you are in marketing, many of you are not. Put your hands up if you like being marketed at. Put your hands up if you find most marketing slightly irritating, like the TV ads. So we've got an uphill battle then, because in a digital world, you can avoid it. You see, I, I've stopped watching live TV. <laughs> Life's too short to watch TV ads. Why do I want to watch a TV ad? I'll always stream it and skip. So I, in fact, I'm very resistant to marketing. 
and I'm sure most of you are too, because you've already told me how much you hate being marketed at. So you spend your life trying to avoid marketing messages. So that means we have to think of different ways to communicate with our customers. And how do we do it? We do it through instant information provided in a convenient way at the speed of light, right when they need it. So an example of perfect marketing is, uh, is, 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 for an, uh, is for it to be quite clear that if you go on to, let's say, the Marks and Spencer site and you type in what you're looking for, they will show you which stores have that particular pair of shoes in your size. And as you walk into the store with your iPhone, it will drive you there. It was, no, no, three meters to the left, three meters to the left, one meter to the right, and there, there, good heavens, there is the pair of black shoes in my size. Because actually life's too short to order it online, I need it tonight, <laughs> I need it now. So Mark, this is a, a journey of life, it's about information and revelation. There's nothing else that really tantalizes us more. It's, I thought you'd like to know, this is really important for you. That's amazing. This is the kind of thing, and this feeds on little data. You hear a lot about big data. I'll tell you, in most businesses represented here, you're going to waste an absolute fortune trying to make money out of big data. The money's in tiny data, a tiny set of about 0.01% of the data you have, and the magic is knowing which way to look. And when you're looking in the right direction, when you've taken your, your glasses off, or you've opened your eyes like the waiter has, you'll find all the data flooding to you. Here's a nice piece of little data that's making Tesco a fortune. So what happens is, Tesco, as you know, you shop in there and they instantly, at the speed of light, give you information. Information, revelation. Information is, this is how much, this is how much you would have lost if you'd gone and shopped in Waitress. <laughs> and then, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, we got it wrong. I'm sorry to confess to you today that it cost you money. In fact, you've lost two pounds and 22 pence by shopping here today. I'm so sorry, we will check our prices in future, but just as a little thank you, here's two pounds and 20 pence back. Revelation, information, revelation. And it's so powerful, the customers talk about it to their friends, and that is the biggest form of advertising of all. You don't even need to know who the customer is. This is little data delivered at the speed of light to someone checking out right now. Here's another example of little data, in fact, it's a bit similar to the waiter story. So, here you are. This is a, a bit of a, uh, okay, so this is me. I'm walking into the store. I'm trying to find uh, a dress for my wife. I think I got the idea of what she wants. I'm walking in there, and the first thing that happens is I'm accosted. Can I help you, sir? I, no, 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 I'm fine. I, I'm, I'm just, just looking. Three and a half seconds later, oh, can I help you, sir? I, I, I'm fine. I'm just, I'm just looking. I'm perfectly okay, thank you. After the third person accosts me in three minutes saying, can I help you, sir? What is what I do? What do I do? Leave. I leave. Put your hands up if you have left a store as a result of being asked for help. Get offered help. You are offered help and you leave. Why? Well, it wasn't a very agile strategy, was it? See, what happened was they failed to understand the psyche of a shopper. They've been through training programs that said, now listen, to, you know, every waiter uses his eyes. You should listen to Dr. Patrick Dixon's video on YouTube. Watch it. Every waiter uses his eyes. Every sales assistant uses their eyes. As soon as he comes in, you say, hello, how are you? Would you like a cup of coffee? What would you like? How can I help you today? The only trouble is they fled out the door and disappeared. So what happens? Should I tell you the right way to market to these kinds of people? Information and revelation. Don't market at them. I can't do it. I need, I need the props. I need some clothes, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, can I borrow your jacket? Okay, so you have to pretend. It's a game. You pretend to be busy. Oh, good morning. <laughs> you put the same things down, you pick them up, you pack them up, repackage them, come back with something else. I said, get into real trouble if I take your handbag. You t <laughs> you put it back. Are you okay there? Okay, fine. <laughs> I'll be back in a moment. And what happens is... <laughs> Are you, are you all right there? Are you, are you, are you, fine. <laughs> I don't know where I've got this from. Where's this come from? <laughs> it's yours. Okay, thank you. Um, but the point is this. You're developing what? Creating space, showing friendliness, and availability. I'm going to stay in there all morning. <laughs> it, sorry, what's your name? Martin. Ma actually, could you help me? 
<laughs> I just don't know what to do. I've got about, I've got, I've got 10 minutes, and in fact, I stay two hours, <laughs> and I buy the shop. Because actually, I know she'd love that. Oh, my goodness, that's fantastic. That's it. I've been looking for that for months. And you've just taken me around and become a friend. You see, it's all about building the tribe, and I've become part of your family at that point. And the next time I come in the shop, I say, oh, where's that guy <laughs> that helped me last year? Oh, there you are. Fantastic. Can you help me again? This is how to build business. And, you know, it's different from what we think. Fast, urban, tribal, universal, radical. Um, universal is about mega cities, mega trends, mega everything, mega chains, the future of retail. 70% of all retail is less than eight companies in this country. Massive consolidation. So how do you make your voice heard? Very difficult if you're selling. Well, if you've got a product, it means you're going to have to sell most of it to Lidl, Tesco, Waitrose. You haven't got much room for manoeuvre. So it all depends on things like really smart packaging on the outside, uh, it, and actually the challenge is that most consumers are bored because most of the time they go shopping and they're seeing the same brands, same stuff. I don't know whether I'm in Singapore or whether I'm in Timbuktu. Every, every department store I look at is virtually the same, especially Giorgio Armani outlets are the same, I've discovered. In every airport outlet, in every shopping centre in the world, the only thing that changes is the currency on the label, correct? So by the time you've seen Giorgio Armani's thing and, uh, and, uh, uh, and Christian Dior and all the others, you've done it. You are out of global shopping. There is nothing left to excite you. So that is a real challenge for super miles, superstores, customer boredom. Because if there's no point in going to the shop, you just do it online. And that means empty shopping stores. It means the end of magic and atmosphere. Everything converges in price and quality and experience and looks incredibly boring. So you find shopping stores say, OK, we'll put in a fountain. <laughs> this is the future of retail as a fountain. Then they say, OK, well, we'll create an internal environment. We'll say, we'll create an internal environment. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll put bars in that people can have. We'll smell, feel, touch. We'll, we'll, we'll let them smell the food. We'll let them taste the vegetables. We'll, we're actually surprising how few supermarkets let you touch tomatoes anymore. And we'll, let the, we'll, we'll, put the, we'll put the market inside the supermarket. We'll try and create the atmosphere of the street and pop it in retail and hope no one notices that it's all frozen. And when it is frozen, we'll, we'll beam smell into the store so it feels like it's not frozen and feels like you might actually want to eat that kind of stuff. Uh, these are the games that are being played and it's all going mobile, all location-based because I've said to you, that it's all about the journey of life. So Tesco has done this. They've taken the data where the customer is using the mobile. They sent SMSs to 25 to 35-year-old women who are very close to the store. They had 40,000 more people walk inside. These are really important things. It's understanding that when they've gone inside and they've shopped, they may still not buy from you. They've gone inside, they've shopped, and they're buying it online from a competitor. They've gone inside and shopped, and they're buying it online from your own store and walking out because life's too short to carry things home. They're buying it, um, and when they're having it delivered at home, of course, actually, it's the wrong place. Life's too short to have things delivered at home five times because you're never there. So it then becomes a click and collect which is growing fast, but actually click and collect is too slow. You've told me that five seconds is a million years, which means that we have to have one hour delivery in an Uber van, preferably in 20 minutes, delivered to you right here, appearing at lunchtime, because you just remembered that your power supply for your phone, you left at home and you're going on a plane tonight. This is the future of retail. It depends on the internet of things, big data, mobile payments, and so on. Now, fast, urban, tribal, universal, radical, radical ways, the R of the future is radical ways to think about your future. And this is also the key to agility. It's, de it's deconstructing what you're doing and thinking again. So let's take packaging. Packaging, you might think, is a pretty boring area. But this has become incredibly agile. This particular organization decided to run an Easter campaign. They changed all the labeling on the side. They put fluffy bunny rabbits and things like that for their Easter thing. And the sales went up 20%. Uh, here is printing on the fly. This is um, let's imagine that um, there's a, a particular contestant that's won X Factor or Britain's Got Talent last night. So what they're doing is the moment they know that result, they're printing the, the, the photograph of the individual that's won it and saying, you too can celebrate X Factor success. Congratulations too. It's on the outside of every piece of packaging and goes straight out at the speed of light, out of Amazon's factory. And they're printing on the fly 
that it's a digitally enabled system which essentially turns your product packaging into a live, living, reactive experience. Um, and uh, as well as that, looking at every single way to, uh, to send additional messaging on the sides of things, on the tops of things, and so on. <coughs> and we certainly need an end to that. Sustainability is a really key issue. You know, uh, packaging, uh, people are becoming increasingly intolerant about this kind of experience. So radical ways to uh, improve the uh, environmental footprint and so on. And then the final phase, uh, oh yes, and here's another example of it. I'm sad to say the truth is that one third of all truck journeys that would take place today around the streets of London are simply carrying air. There's nothing inside the trunk. That's a monstrous and inefficient waste of resources and should be sorted out immediately. It's absolutely ridiculous. I'll tell you it's also ridiculous that often the same trucks are carrying the same products in different directions. So you've got a product, uh, you, can, you can have an iPhone ordered in Boston that funnily enough is being delivered by a courier from a warehouse in near New York and you've got another package from, in the postal system of another identical iPhone going from New York most of the way up to Boston just because that's the way retail works. It's chaotic, wasteful, it should be sorted out and someone should do so in a bedroom in their house with a little app and they'll make a billion dollars. Fast, urban, tribal, universal, radical, the final face of the future, and I must finish. <laughs> the final face of the future is ethics. How do you live in this crazy world that's so fast you can hardly think? So urban with its massive demographic challenges. So tribal that sometimes looking at the press we feel that our world is falling apart. So universal that sometimes countries like Catalonia, uh, Spain, feel that they're losing parts of their identity. So radical that we feel that, that uh, extremists are winning huge power. The answer is we need their things. And we're seeing a gigantic growth in ethical business in every area. It's not just in retail. In fact, companies that are regarded as, quote, ethical investor, uh, investment plays, companies that are right up there on the, on the ethical score, tend to score much higher in terms of growth and return on equity than any other in repeated surveys. Partly because they've got fantastic customer engagement, they've got tremendous uh, ways to attract great talent, and uh, usually because they're more efficient. They're just motivated, passionate, engaged, smart, and incredibly agile. Because they believe it's for a reason. So half of all UK shoppers say that they boycott unethical retailers and brands. Now, it can be about clothing, but it can be about food. It's about, it's about mobilising people, movements, to, quote, do the right thing. And often this is being driven by a younger generation. And they're telling their mum, I'm not eating that. I say, come on, darling, eat it at dinner. No, no, I'm not eating that crap. So, <laughs> what is it? It's not fair trade, mum. Put it in the bin. So, yeah, but that's wasting food. I don't care. I'm not eating it. It's bad. <laughs> it's really important we understand this. And it's also important how big the impact can be from a single he headline uh, that alleges something that is not ethical. If a company is discovered with a single child, a single child, let alone a factory, under the age of 15 at the moment in India, they are going to be roasted. Actually, it's not just under age. There's the issue of whether they are being paid and whether they are voluntarily working or whether they're under duress, even inside a country like the UK, where perhaps there are 40 or 50 or 60,000 people, we estimate, at least working in terrible conditions, involuntarily, effectively enslaved, working inside our supply chains, producing stuff for retail. It's a big challenge. So ethics very important as part of this big picture. So what's my conclusion message? My concluding message is this. Actually, it's the smallest things that can make us the most agile. It's the smallest things that can make the biggest changes in customer experience. And it's the smallest things that often cost the least and have the greatest impact, which is very, very good news at a conference when we're talking about making tremendous changes. And as we look at just retail as just one industry example, we've seen over and over again that by responding to little things that make a huge difference, you can make the world a fantastically better place. So I wish you every success as you look to re-engineer your own businesses and lives in an agile way for the future of humankind and for your bottom line. Thank you very much.